Okay, next uh, speaker is Harvey Rosenthal. And, um, well, I could read all this, but uh, he's uh, executive director of uh, NIAPRIS, which is a psychosocial rehabilitation um, umbrella organization for New York State. Um, but I'd like to just say that I've worked with Harvey for probably 25 years. Um, and uh, he's, he's someone who's been through his own lived experience, shares that uh, openly and has been a tremendous uh, support and ally uh, to our recovery movement, and I'm very grateful he's here. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. How are you? Good. Well, I am Harvey Rosenthal, and I'm a person in long-term mental health recovery, 43 years, and uh, it began with a six-week hospitalization when I was 19. And 1969, and I just want to say about my recovery that it has been multimodal. Uh, so it has involved therapy, it still does, therapy, shiatsu, peer support, and medication. The difference is I choose the medication and I choose my therapist, and that doesn't happen to a lot of people that I represent. And some would say that that's a form of violence. Um, so I've been a provider. For, I was a provider for 18 years, and I'm actually 21 years as, as the director of NIAPRS. And we're not really a, a, a psychosocial rehab organization. We're a peer-led. I'm a peer. We use that term. And most of my staff are peers. And we are a, so we're a peer-led sort of coalition of tens of thousands of peers and providers in New York. And we work to promote recovery, rehabilitation rights, and community inclusion. I also sit on the Bazelon board with Ellen, and I'm a, a member of dance groups as well. So I just want to talk about the impact of violence on us. So I've been now an advocate for 21 years, and one of the biggest areas I've had to work in is the fallout that comes when there is a rare but horrific episode of violence. And I want to tell you that that is god-awful from the point of me and my community. We shudder every time these things happen because we know the fallout is going to come on us, that we're going to be scapegoated, defamed, talked about in ways, as Dan said, that no other group, you can't get away with talking about other groups like you can us. There was a time you could do that with African Americans. You could do it with uh, um, and such, but there is no longer. But it is still very much in evidence with us. And it leads to terrible sort of media coverage, as you know, and public policy. There's a bill in Congress now that really serves to defame and depersonalize and criminalize us. Now, while these connections of violence are unfounded by the facts, they bring this terrible backlash, which is threatening now to undo decades of progress we've made in promoting recovery, wellness, hope, and dignity, independence, and integration. So I'm going to ask you today to join forces with all of us to change the narrative. We need you. Please don't sit on the sidelines and measure and discuss and make this just an academic sort of discussion. You're part of our community. You're talking about us. We need you. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. So mental illness, first of all, is so loosely defined. Um, one would have you believe that autism is a mental illness, a la Adam Lanza. But if you look it up, as far as I can tell, it's a developmental disability, not a mental illness. One would tell you now, because of a Kansas ruling in the Supreme Court, that, be, that being a sex offender is a mental illness. We have hundreds of sex offenders in, state, in our mental health hospitals in New York. One would tell you that, that being a sociopath is a mental illness. So it's a, it's a, it's a um, large pool that's used to talk about mental illness. And, uh, and substance use, I heard that mentioned today as a, as a mental illness. So it's important, I, I think, to recognize the adverse experiences of people as well as their diagnosis. Um, you know, and I understand to some degree what the public does. When there are horrific acts, unspeakable acts, we're, we're prone to say, you'd have to be crazy to do that. But there's, there's, that's a term that gets applied to us inappropriately. Um, so, you know, it just comes back on us. So there have been, as you heard today, numerous studies over the past 15 years that have underscored that we're no more violent than the, than the general public or just a small amount. In fact, Swanson, who was who's, uh, Jeff Swanson from Duke, who's one of his studies was cited, 
said also that 4% of, of violent crimes are affiliated with our community. And Mulvey in 2013 clarified that to mean violence is, you have to define that very carefully. It tends to be expansive and talk about threatening behavior, frightening behavior, but not what you think of when you talk about violence. Swanson says one in 70,000 of people in our community are committing, murders, are, are committing murder to strangers. So in New York, we have 140,000 people in our most who are deemed serious and persistently mentally ill. That's the term they use. That means that two of them are, 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 are in, in, uh, in risk of doing stranger violence, according to Jeff. Then you hear a lot about mass murders. Now, there was a study published just a couple of weeks ago by a noted expert in mass murders, <laughs> Fox, out of Boston, and, and Delatour, and he said, Again, a week or so ago, there is no clear, clear relationship between a psychiatric diagnosis and mass murder. And Mike Stone, Michael Stone of, of Columbia said, most of the mass murderers are young men who are not psychotic. They tend to be loners who hold a grudge and are filled with rage. The policy con consequences of this are there's campaigns to force medication on people, to force treatment on people, to take away their rights. After, after Newtown, there are laws now that make it necessary in New York to, if you have a mental illness and you own a gun, and you have a session with your therapist where you say, well, I was so mad. I mean, there's mad and there's angry, destructive sort of impulses. But in New York, if you uh, sp speak about such things, you're on a registry. And God knows what that information is going to be used. So there's a lot of talk also about victimization. We are indeed 11 times more likely to, to be the victims of violence and five times more likely to be murder victims, five times more likely. Um, and if you think about it, just think about the violent culture that we live in. Um, there are, according to the research, 100,000 people who are shot every year, 209 every day, 86 die each day, 30 are murdered, 53 are, uh, die according to suicide, one by a a police intervention, and I want to talk about that in a bit. But we are the victims of violence, and that is lost. And I have to say, if we are the victims of violence, then why are we talking so much about the harm we're going to do to others? Why are we talking about the harm that's done to us? Where are we? Where are you on that? Who's going to protect us? We are not the threat that we're seen as, but we are threatened by the public 11 times more likely. Um, you've talked about suicide, so I won't. Um, so there are, are a number of reasons why it's overblown. There's the public fears that you heard about. There are studies that, that, say, that have uh, 80, 48 to 75 percent of Americans who believe that we're violent. The tabloids and media coverage is horrific. I live in New York, the home of the Daily News and the New York Post. These are tabloids that make a living, particularly the Post on defaming us. Let me read you some headlines. Deadly front page, sometimes on the cover. Uh, deadly man men roam our streets. Get the violent crazies off our streets. Here come the crazies. You know what here come the crazies were, Bob? Adult home residents that were going to be discharged finally into the community thanks to a lawsuit that you pressed. But the answer was somewhat stimulated by the adult home operators who were going to lose the business was here come the crazies. Letting madmen roam. Let me read you something. Common sense has long dictated that dangerously deranged people should be, this is an editorial, be confined to mental hospitals or placed on a common regiment of medications. Having humanely chosen to help the mentally ill live in their, live in their communities, humanely chosen to let mentally ill live in their communities. Uh, New York has relied on drug treatment to prevent the afflicted, the afflicted from becoming a peril to themselves. I won't go on. E. Fuller Torrey, who you may have heard about. Have you heard of E. Fuller Torrey? Psychiatrist often quoted, has a unique agenda, laser-like, on promoting us as violent in an effort to pass forced treatment laws throughout the country. Um, so, and he's part of a well-funded group called TAC, the, the, the Treatment Advocacy Center, well-funded by a Stanley Foundation. He has millions. So he writes articles like Deadly Madmen mental health system still lets them roam. The word roam, have you heard, seen that a lot in this? We are roaming. 
you know, roaming on the streets in a very dangerous way. Uh, in 2007, the Daily News talked about that there were five to six murders that were committed by people with mental illnesses that year. Well, I looked it up. There were four in New York City. There were 494 murders that year. Five out of 494. The five were on the front page for days to weeks. The 489, not so much. Um, so, Tory, so we talked about Tory. Tory works with a guy named named DJ Jaffe, who's a PR guy out of New York and is dead set on forced treatment. He said once, from a marketing perspective, it may be necessary to capitalize on the fear of violence to get this law passed. Then he said, more recently, assisted outpatient treatment, forced treatment, is a court order that requires historically violent and non-compliant mentally ill to accept treatment as a condition for living in the community. That's not even accurate, but listen to how it sounds. Then you, we talked about the gun lobby. There are a handful of groups that are fighting to change the media image. One of them is something called the National Stigma, the Clearinghouse, Jean Arnold. I recommend her to you. The most stunning thing that happened in the last year was the Associated Press released some guidelines for its reporters. And it said things like this. Do not describe an individual as mentally ill unless it is clearly pertinent to the story, diagnosed properly sourced. Mental illness is a general condition. Uh, many experts consider autism to be a developmental disorder, not a mental illness. Do not use derogatory terms such as insane, crazy, crazed, nuts, or deranged. Avoid descriptions that connote pity, such as afflicted with or suffers from. Do not assume that mental illness is a factor in violent crime and verify, verify statements to that end. Then there's a mental health media project that the three of us and some others have been trying to fund without success that would monitor the press and correct these misimpressions. We need that. So after these episodes of violence, you hear the same term eventually. Each group is using it for their own purposes. We have a broken mental health system. Have you heard that term? You heard a lot. The, the, the New Freedom Commission under Bush, that was a big finding of theirs. And they recommended a lot of improvements in our system to end the fragmentation, the silos, the lack of coordination, to reduce disparities, to promote recovery, to address suicide and stigma. For consumers, a broken system, as Dan has mentioned, feels illness-focused, disempowering, dependency, fostering hopeless, and overemphasis on medication. For families, it means they're not getting enough help with their loved ones, and they're terrified and enraged about it. For Tory and TAC, it means more forced treatment. That's their idea of fixing a broken system. And for the media, a broken system means unchecked, unchecked violence. So how do we fix what's broken? Well, I urge you, we all have to come together and change, and change the, the narrative. Until we, st we stop it, until we find our moment, we will continue to be reported that way. And you will, we will shudder. We will be at the victims of these pogroms that happen after an episode. People will actually be afraid to go to treatment and disclose. So uh, we need your help. We have to change that. When these episodes happen, we don't need evil authority to be quoted. It's forced treatment. We need to be quoted. We need to find a narrative. We need to all come together and take back that narrative. And we need everyone on board, all hands on deck, consumers, families, providers, advocates, government, academics, researchers. It's about us, and we need your help. We need a Selma moment, a Stonewell moment, a Seneca Falls moment. We need to push back. We need to say enough. We're going to need your help. We can't just have you, you know, march, you know, focusing on one little element. I'm not, I'm not attacking, but I'm just saying too often we're talking about violence, about this population. We are that population. We need to be humanized. We need to be helped. We are the victims of that kind of violence. We're actually trying to organize national days of dignity, demonstrations around the country. We need to change the, the narrative, and we need your help. Thank you.